Welcome, everybody, and happy Thursday. Um, as some of you may have heard, this session will be recorded and is being recorded. Um, we're going to get started right on the top of the hour because there's lots of information to pack into today. Um, hi, I'm Mariama Dryak Valley, my pronouns are she, her. I'm the director for the Polar Science Early Career Community Office, or PSECO. Uh, which is a national level office that supports polar scientists who are early in their careers through community building, professional development, funding, and more. And PSECO is hosted at the University of Colorado Boulder within the Series Center for Education, Engagement, and Evaluation. Um, and we're really excited to be putting on this event today in conjunction with IRPIC Collaborations and the National Science Foundation Office of Polar Program Program Officers to learn about how to write a one pager to summarize an idea you want to pitch to a funding agency. I'll hand it over to Liz to introduce themselves quickly. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, my name is Liz Weinberg. I am the engagement director for IRPIC. If you're not familiar with familiar with IRPIC, uh, that acronym stands for the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. Uh, so we uh, bring together federal agencies, researchers and communities to help everyone collaborate on Arctic research. And I also have a dog uh, who is barking right now. So I will keep this quick and just say, uh, I'll put it in the chat that you can sign up uh, at ArabicCollaborations.org. Awesome. And we're excited to be, um, to also have Alex Padilla and Carla Pineda Velez uh, on the call with the Paseco team and in the series. Uh, Center for Education, Engagement, and Evaluation um, to help with technical support today. So if you have any issues, please direct a message either to Alex or Carla. Alex and Carla, if you could use the raised hand function so folks can see who you are, that would be great. Um, and then I will brief, I will be um, introducing the, the program officers who are with us on the call um, just before I hand it off to them. Um, but if, if, uh, if y'all want to give a wave briefly now, that'd be great too. Um, but we would love to begin our event today with a land acknowledgement. Paseco and IRPIC both support polar scientists in locations across the United States and beyond, with research focused on both poles and in high alpine regions across the world. And we acknowledge that much of that science takes place on the unceded traditional territories and ancestral homelands of indigenous peoples and that some of the research done in these locations has historical roots in colonialism. With this land acknowledgement, we celebrate the many contributions of native peoples to our understanding of the polar regions and recognize the sophisticated and intricate knowledge systems that indigenous peoples have developed and continue to develop in relationship to their lands. And we encourage our participants to do the same. Um, at the core of Paseco is inclusion, and we expect that all attendees will adhere to Paseco's community guidelines when interfacing with others on the call, which Alex is pasting a link to in the chat as well, in case you're not familiar. I will also just note um, this workshop, very much come as you are. Uh, we know that joining virtual meetings these days is hard. We know that some folks are currently sitting in a heat wave, perhaps with uh, very little air conditioning. Uh, so we're really grateful that you made the time and space to come together with us today. It's not a small thing. Uh, and if you've got pets or partners uh, or children, dogs like I do in the background, no worries. Uh, just please keep yourself on mute so that we don't get a bunch of background noise. Uh, so we have muted you if you as you came in, so you don't need to worry about that, but just keep an eye on that mute button. Uh, we would also love for you to turn on your cameras, especially during the Q&A period, but if that's not possible for you today because uh, you are sweating during a heat wave, we totally understand that as well. Uh, Mariama, back to you. Thanks. Uh, just want to go briefly over the outline for the workshop today. Um, we are doing introductions and would like to welcome you to the workshop. Um, we'll then briefly hear a very brief overview of the National Science Foundation and Office of Polar Programs, um, but the main content of the day will be how to write a one-pager overview, um, which Kelly and Lauren will be sharing with us. Um, and then the end of the session will be opened up to a question and answer session with Office of Polar Program Program Officers uh, on the call. And um, we'll go over how to, and Dave Dave Porter, I just saw, is also in the room. Dave Porter will also be joining us um, as a program officer, speaking to these, um, how to write a one pager. Um, but we will go over how to ask questions and whatnot during the Q&A section of the call, so you can have your full attention on the content that's about to be delivered. 
Um, so with that, um, I want to briefly or, or spend some time introducing the folks with us on the call. We have Kelly Brent um, with us today, associated with the Arctic Natural Sciences and Antarctic Glaciology programs within OPP. Um, we also have David Porter with Antarctic Ocean and Atmospheric Science and the Postdoctoral Research Fellowships as well. Um, welcome, Dave. And we have Lauren Culler as well on the call um, with the Arctic Observing Network and postdoctoral research fellowships as well. So we're really excited uh, for you all to be with us here today and that everyone can join us here too. Um, so I will hand it over to the program officers and thanks Kelly, uh, take it away. All right, thank you. So hi everybody, I'm Lauren Culler and uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, and thank you all for attending. We're really pleased to see so much interest in uh, the NSF one pager. So uh, I'm with the Arctic Sciences section in the Office of Polar Programs, and uh, my core program is the Arctic Observing Network. And I also work closely with Dr. Dave Porter on the Postdoc Research Fellowship Program, which we'll be spotlighting a little bit today. Um, I'm an IPA rotator, so I come in from Dartmouth. I've been at NSF for about a year. Uh, and my background is in Arctic ecology, and I've done a lot of field work in Greenland um, previous to coming and joining NSF. So the others will introduce themselves as I pass the baton to them. So thank you, Kelly. Um, so we wanted to just kind of start out with a really kind of big overview of OPP, since some of you may be familiar with OPP. Others may be new to OPP. So OPP, Office of Polar Programs, sits within the Geosciences Director at the National Science Foundation. And our science programs are divided between Arctic and Antarctic. We actually have three sections within the office. One of those is Antarctic Infrastructure and Logistics. And then we have the Antarctic Sciences and the Arctic Sciences. So this slide just kind of lays out what the core programs are within the Antarctic and Arctic side of OPP. They're organized slightly differently, as you might see within the Antarctic. The core programs are divided more sort of disciplinary speak, um, whereas on the Arctic side, uh, it's kind of organized around sort of these interdisciplinary clusters of natural sciences, social sciences, system science, and Arctic observing network. That said, we're all funding, you know, science in support of key science questions that are applicable to both polar regions we work together a lot, and we do actually also have some cross-cutting programs in polar cyber infrastructure, education and outreach, and then this um, postdoctoral research fellowship or the PRF program that some of you may be familiar with. And so without discussing in depth each of these core programs, we don't have time for that today, but we wanted to make sure folks kind of know the general organization. And then the link on this slide here will take you to the um, organization chart for OPP. So rather than list out all the program directors affiliated with each program, the best bet is to go to the org chart, which is up to date who's managing each because we do rely about, I think half of our program directors are rotators. Uh, it can vary, you know, who is leading what program. So if you're curious to learn more about a program or you want to submit to a particular program, go to that org chart and make sure you reach out to the program directors um, affiliated with that program. Next slide. We also just wanted to provide some resources and I'm sure these will get sent around to you as well after today's session. For those of you who have not written a proposal to NSF before, one thing you'll hear us refer to frequently is the PAPPG, which is sort of the main handbook for how to write and put together an NSF proposal. This applies across NSF. So often we reply to emails with per the PPG, PAPPG, see section two, uh, paragraph four, and we'll refer, if you have a question about writing a proposal, it's in the PAPPG, um, but feel free to reach out with questions too. It's a very long document. I wouldn't suggest that you sit down and read it top to bottom, but have it um, on reference. And the other thing I'll mention about the PAPPG is it gets updated fairly regularly. So when you do go look at that document or if you Google it, you want to always make sure you're looking at the most the current version. And the NSF website should let you know at the top of the page if you're not looking at the current version, it will direct you to the current version. There were some pretty big changes made to this just about a month ago. So we always want to make sure folks are looking at the, the current version of, of that guide. 
We have a, a funding search tool if you're looking for opportunities. We'll talk briefly today also about some relevant funding opportunities for folks on this call. Uh, we also encourage you to look at our current solicitations, which is what we put out when we're interested in proposals. For example, there's Arctic Research Opportunities solicitation right now that describes the types of proposals that we're interested in and the core programs that you can submit to. We also put out something called Dear Colleague Letters. This isn't a solicitation, so this isn't necessarily something that you would be submitting a proposal in response to, but it's more a way that NSF can get out information um, to the community, let you know about a solicitation, or let you know that, you know, for example, we might be really interested in receiving proposals that make use of existing samples or make use of existing data. And that's one of the current DCLs that we have right now. So um, please excuse me that we are getting a major thunderstorm here. So <laughs> hopefully I don't get cut off. Um, so we wanted to let folks know about these dear colleague letters because sometimes there is some confusion about a dear colleague letter versus a solicitation. We put on also office hours about twice a year where the Arctic and Antarctic program officers will put together a presentation with relevant information and updates for the community. So stay, stay tuned for those. Uh, we have an OPP newsletter that you can sign up for, and then a couple other ways that you can find out about OPP um, program solicitations and dear colleague letters, etc. cetera, uh, is CryoList, which some of you may be aware of is a, a really nice resource and listserv that you can join. And then the Arctic Research Consortium of the U.S. also puts out uh, Arctic Info, which comes out in sort of a newsletter format, so you can also sign up for those. Um, and yeah, thanks Liz for putting in the chat. Um, the office hours are often hosted via IARPIC collaborations and I believe they're recorded. So you can actually go back and, and look at those if you don't, if you're not able to make it. So lots of resources. I know I'm throwing all of these at you pretty quickly, but just wanted to kind of let you know that there's a lot out there to help you sort of navigate OPP. And then last slide before I turn it over to Dr. Kelly Brunt, uh, we wanted also to just kind of tell you about some of our funding opportunities. So we know that there's a lot of folks on here, early career, graduate students, postdocs, also faculty who may be recruiting graduate students or postdocs. And so we're really excited for you know proposals that come in to support early career researchers. For graduate students, this often is through a graduate research fellowship program. This is an NSF-wide program that provides um, three years of stipend support. For, uh, for graduate students, you can look at that solicitation. Those proposals are due in October. And we also have uh, Arctic Doctoral Dissertation Research Improvement Grants. So this is currently only for Arctic. We don't have this for the Antarctic right now. And this provides, I think, up to 40K in funding. And this isn't for your stipend, but this is to improve your research. So if you need an additional field site to get to or some additional analyses, that is what that um, funding opportunity is for. So if you're working on your dissertation, look into that as a source of funding. And then uh, the postdoctoral research fellowship program has been running for a few years. This is a really exciting program. It's uh, across the Arctic and the Antarctic section. So we welcome proposals from any discipline uh, in the polar sciences. And if you are awarded a PRF. It comes with two years of a postdoc stipend, uh, in addition to 15K a year in research funds. And in that proposal, you identify a host institution and host mentor. So it's your own funding. Uh, you can take it to an institution that's the best fit for the research. Uh, and we find this really exciting because it's also can be an entry point into polar research for folks who haven't worked in the polar regions before. We get really excited when there's methods developed from outside of the polar regions that then can be applied to an important polar science question. Uh, it's just, I think, a really exciting program. And um, when we start talking about one pagers too, this is one where we really encourage folks to reach out with your ideas um, to either Dave or myself, and we can talk about that. And it's often the first time that folks are putting together um, an NSF proposal. Uh, and so there's a lot that goes into that. And it's a good activity to, to go through that process. So I think I'll stop there and turn it over to Kelly to talk about some additional funding opportunities. Thanks. Hey, hey, my name. Thanks, Lauren. My name's Kelly 
front. And I'm also similar to Lauren and similar to Dave, who you'll meet in a minute. Um, I'm also an IPA uh, or a rotator. Uh, I'm, I come in on a temporary position and my home institutions are University of Maryland and NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, so I wanna just talk briefly about our two main solicitations. So you know, after you've gone through a postdoc uh, and you're you know, an early career um, a person, either soft money or tenure track, we've got two of our main solicitations here. Um, as Lauren pointed out, solicitations and dear colleague letters are either ways to you know, directly solicit uh, input from the community or messaging to the community that often points you towards good opportunities. But the two big ones we have, one in the Arctic, uh, Arctic research opportunities. Um, as Lauren pointed out, please, you know, read the solicitations, read the PAPG. Um, some of the programs within Arctic have target dates and others do not. So read the solicitation really closely so that you know if, if you're aiming towards a target date or if it's, it's completely open. Um, and the, solicita the solicitations change quite regularly. I, um, <laughs> uh, I did fully appreciate how fast things can move here at the NSF. So uh, it's been a, a pleasant surprise. I think it's a good thing that things keep evolving. But what that means is, as Lauren said with the uh, PAPG, if you go to the website and you think you're hitting the most recent solicitation, look at the top matter. Just make sure that that solicitation hasn't been archived and replaced by something new, or it'll generally point you in the right direction. Uh, for both Arctic and Antarctic uh, research um, solicitations, you apply to the top level. You don't apply necessarily to the specific program. On the Arctic side, we actually request that, you know, maybe you suggest that the bottom of the first page, you know, on the first page of a proposal, you generally have some sort of proposal summary followed by the intellectual merit summary and followed by a broader impacts summary. We ask that right at the bottom of that, you actually give us a sense of what programs you think um, that that proposal is relevant to. Keep in mind, we're gonna go through this one pager exercise and we're gonna help you identify those programs in that process. But that's kind of a new thing that we're doing on the Arctic side, applying at the top level, but providing a suggestion after you've applied to the, to the appropriate program. So some of them have target dates. Target dates mean, you know, you can apply anytime, but you know, there's two big dates that you should be aiming for, uh, especially with respect to panel review cycles. Uh, the other main, uh, solicitation that Office of Pro Polar Programs has right now is Antarctic research not requiring uh, U.S. Antarctic program support. And that's kind of important. Uh, that's support in any manner. Um, if you're traveling with another national Antarctic program to the Antarctic, um, you do a lot of work with the folks from South Korea, a lot of work uh, with folks from the British Antarctic Survey. If you're traveling with another Antarctic program, you want to make sure that everything is outside of uh, U.S. Antarctic program support. So you can apply for uh, sort of analysis support of data that you're collecting in the field from, from other programs. You just want to make sure that your proposal doesn't implicate any USAP resources at all. That includes things like the physical qualification, the PQ process, or um, cargo, things that you don't always think of. Uh, but then there's a whole host of other types of proposals that are non-field-based proposals, and we're, we accept those uh, at currently at any time. But again, keep an eye out on solicitations. Those things evolve uh, over time. So we, uh, both Lauren and I have mentioned Dear Colleague letters, not necessarily as a direct funding mechanism, but often they're either messages to the community or messages to the, you know, about what's going on inside NSF or messages to the community about things we're interested in seeing right now. And I've given um, a great example of a couple of uh, dear colleague letters that are out there. Big one is, I, I think Lauren mentioned this, the uh, DCL, the dear colleague letter supporting data and sample reuse in the polar uh, in polar research. And I've kind of given a list. This is a good screen to uh, screen capture. <laughs> uh, I've given a list here of things just to remind you that these are great, great resources inside our community. The NSF has paid a lot of money over the years. Um, I think it's probably in the Bs and the billions <laughs> by the time all is said and done um, of data collection, but also data management on this side and, and long-term archive. Uh, all these data, we're, we're trying to, samples of data, we're trying to make these you know, available to the entire community. We'd love to have you tap into that as a resource. So keep an eye out uh, you know, for these dear colleague letters uh, I think that most of those are somewhat announced in our OPP newsletters, um, but keep an eye on these because I think they offer uh, tremendous information for, for what's going on in the 
and, you know, in both of our sections. And with that, I think I'm turning it over to Dave Porter. It's like a hot quiz, Ram. Sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kelly. Um, and uh, yeah, Dave Porter. Uh, I'm also a rotator from uh, Lamont Darty Earth Observatory, Columbia University. Uh, I manage the Antarctic Oceans and Atmospheric Sciences program. And as Lauren said, uh, co lead the, the PRF with uh, her from the Antarctic side. Um, and on to follow on Kelly's point, real quick, is all of those. Um, data repositories and uh, sample repositories, uh, there's a bunch of uh, office hours that are talk about how to work with them. And so the US SCAR, um, which is, I guess, USSCAR.org um, has just run one of those um, yesterday or two days ago. So look out for more of those because we we understand that's a bit of a barrier is um, knowing exactly how to act, uh, uh, you know get access to these samples. Um, and so, but also they're, they're open for business. So reach out to them and say, hey, I want to get a core. How do I do that? Um, so, uh, but yeah, we'll get into other types of funding um, real quick is, uh, and there's there's specific reasons why NSF has these award mechanisms. And so for the career award, this is, it's called, which is the an interesting, it's not an actual acronym, but Faculty Early Career Development Program, which is colloquially known as career. Um, these are very specific um, programs for uh, pre-tenure faculty who are trying to um, really integrate education into their research and vice versa, research into their education plan. And so these are, uh, here in the Office of Polar Programs, we have a very, uh, um, we hold these in high regard. So we need career proposals to be really excellent. But if you really want to um, do this integration of research and education, this is a, a, a separate program that we really like to support. So um, look up in the career rapids, which are for rapid response research. Think of these as um, deep water horizon happens. You want to get go out there and collect the sample before uh, the, the signal dissipates. Uh, this is exactly what these types uh, of proposals are for. Um, they're internally reviewed if they're below a certain amount, um, which means they can be very fast, but they're they're limited by dollar. So these are really to go out and get data before the phenomenon has passed. Um, it could also be relevant to uh, a research opportunity, say on another vessel or uh, with a research program. Um, the other kind of partner to RAPID is an eager, which is early concept grants for exploratory research. Think high risk, high reward. These are ideas you have that might not pass muster in the normal uh, review process. Maybe it's because uh, reviewers will think this is a lot of money to spend on something that's so risky. Eagers are a great way to do a proof of concept that'll help shore up some preliminary results so that during the review process, you've got something to show. So this is also a, not a very high dollar amount, um, 300K for Eagers, but um, it can go a long way to getting your research ideas um, to a level that could be supportable um, with, a, with a regular proposal. Um, the other two are probably less relevant, um, major research instrument programs. And then there's a mid-scale version of this. These are sort of one to $10 million or even like it's up to a hundred million dollars uh, projects. Think about like major facilities, um, but these are ways of getting a kind of a community resource funded. Um, and I guess there, there's a lot more of these. And uh, kind of the point of this is there's a lot of ways that NSF can fund your research ideas and program officers are, you know, we, this is by no means saying gatekeepers, but um, we can help point you to these or to link you up with these specific programs. We have a lot of these in our back pockets. Um, so reach out to us with your ideas and we can help kind of navigate where um, some of these are, are most appropriate. Um, again, they're, they also described in the PAPG. Um, so you can always, uh, have fun reading it there. All right, next. 
So related to Lauren's comment about the PAPPG is that is what we use to reference what, what policies are involved with um, reviewing proposals, submitting proposals, and then um, dealing with the awards. Uh, in the same way as, as you as proposers should be reading the solicitations very carefully because that is what governs how the review process happens and how an eventual award will be made. So, um, you know, we don't have that many solicitations as Kelly pointed out currently, but um, read them carefully. There's sometimes there's one or two lines in there that are very important um, about eligibility, about um, for the PRF, for example, we have, there's three additional merit review criteria um, you don't have to hit those explicitly, but of course that could help during the review process um, to really spell out those review criteria um, for the reviewers. And that's something that reading the solicitation carefully um, and making sure you've checked all the boxes. And you know we try to be helpful by structuring the solicitations, but you know we you know it's, we can't update solicitations that frequently because it takes a while to go through policy. And so we are trying to make improvements, but sometimes we're delayed. So um, yeah, re read them. And of course, if you have any questions, that's the other part of this, this uh, session is talk to your program officers. Um, and so, yeah, I think the key part of this list here is deadlines and target dates. Pay attention because some have them and some do not. Um, all right, next slide, Kelly. So um, leading into the one pager, um, and as I said before, and I, Lauren and Kelly and hopefully other POs will say is, um, this is a part, we, we'll say reach out to your program officer um, at any time. And, but what makes it, you know, the conversation with your program officer most helpful is if we can give you good feedback. And the one pager is one of those ways that can ensure that uh, we have enough information to help you. So typically how it happens is we'll get an email um, saying, I have some research ideas and if we'll ask for a one pager and we, it's called a one pager, but um, you know, to be honest, it can spill over to two. In fact, that's probably what we would ask. Um, so think of this as, you know, it's a little bit of your, you know, a component of this is your elevator pitch right? What do you want to do? Um, what's the big picture? Why is there a knowledge gap? Um, give us, uh, why is it important to NSF now? Um, we have, we get a lot of proposals, but why is it important now that, you know, try to sell us that on that? Um, and again, this is to help us give you feedback on, on ways you can make your research ideas more relevant to our solicitations. Um, how are you going to do this? This is somewhat relevant in making sure that you're, um, you have a sound methodology um, to make sure your proposal's as strong as it can be. Um, and going along with that, we would, you know, right now in Antarctic science, this is not relevant, but do, for Arctic, of course, um, is does it involve field work? That necessitates another aspect of uh, working with NSF, um, but we can, you know, Point you to resources to make sure that happens time in a timely fashion. Is there lab work? Um, is it going to be, you know, based on remote sensing or modeling? And these are all things that can help us give you feedback. In addition to just sort of those, um, sort of the summary of your project, we would, uh, it would benefit us if uh, we had a little more details on the scope of your project. A lot of what, or some of what um, is reviewed for a proposal is whether or not the um, scope of work matches the resources requested. And so with a one pager, it really helps us to know what sort of scale of project you're thinking. What's the number of personnel? What are the different career stages involved? A rough budget um, definitely helps so we can help guide you on what's most right-sized for, for your research ideas. Um, and I've talked a lot about intellectual merit, but equal on equal footing to intellectual merit is broader impacts. And so we wanna make sure that when you reach out to us with your one pager, we get these quite a bit. There's no broader impacts mentioned in the one pager at all. 
um, we will ask you about what you um, your broader impact activities are. They don't have to be, you know, fully fleshed out at this time, but we want to make sure you're thinking about broader impacts um, early on in the proposal process. What do we have next up is Kelly? Oh, so the next steps. Maybe we hand it back to Mariama. Or... We, we talked about this briefly. This gives you a timeline of what we wanted to get out of today. And this, um, this specific workshop uh, goes hand in hand with a workshop. Um, uh, it looks like 17th of July. Sorry, I had to, look, <laughs> had to consult this as well. But this gives you a timeline of what we thought we would do. Um, basically, we're going to start by having you guys fill in a Google form. Those Google forms will help us break you folks into smaller, you know, from our perspective, manageable groups so that you guys can uh, develop a one pager together uh, and then submit that one pager. And then, really, almost on a one on one, one program officer to one team, you'll you'll actually get direct feedback on that one pager and guidance for how to do these in the future. Um, so that's the overview of what we're thinking here, but I will turn it back over to Mariama and <laughs> see where she wants to take this now. Yeah, and I'll just note, um, while this slide's still up, we'll send this timeline to, to you all via email as well. Um, but I want to emphasize two things that are on the screen. One is that between tomorrow or when you're sorted into groups, which ideally will be tomorrow, and the 10th of July, you'd be working into a group to develop a one-pager based on some common interest. And then you would submit the one pager on like midnight, 10th of July, before that ideally, but some people like working to deadlines. Um, and then that'll give the program officers some time to review it to give that real-time feedback. And one, one um, additionally important thing is to note, we're not expecting every single person to write individual one pagers. We're asking groups to write a one pager together, which is also a great exercise in collaboration. Um, Liz. Can I add? Can I add something critical to this? Actually, and that is, Go for it. yeah, yeah. Um, this isn't really a place for you as an early career person to be workshopping your best idea to bring it forward in a team setting. You might want to keep that in your back pocket. Honestly, um, we'll put you into groups that have common interests so that you guys can actually have a good science talk, but not necessarily a hey, we want to do this. Um, you know, we're not trying to force any long-term research marriages here. We just want, we want teams that can speak the same language to develop a one pager so that we can give you good feedback on a pretty solid document. Thank you for that. Uh, Lauren, Dave, anything to add about like content of the one pager or, or what to focus on? Okay. Great. I will pass it to Liz. I see we have a question. This is a kind of good segue because we're about to open up to Q&A. Um, so Ellen, if you could hold your question for a second, um, I'm going to pass it to Liz to describe how we'll do the Q&A. Great. And Kelly, if you could bring those slides down so we can all see it, everyone. Uh, I think it'd be great just to have a, a full group setting. So first of all, thank you, Lauren, Dave, and Kelly uh, for a really great presentation on um, how solicitations work at NSF, how the Office of Polar Programs works, and how uh, a one-pager can be helpful. Um, really great overview there. Um, we now have about 20 minutes for a Q&A session. Um, so this is your chance to ask questions about how OPP works, uh, the Office of Polar Programs works, why there are so ma many acronyms, um, what uh, to put in a one-pager, what we're doing between now and July 17th. Um, all questions are, are open uh, and you can ask them in a couple of different ways. One, you can raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you to unmute and ask. Uh, two, you can put it in the chat and one of us will uh, read it so that everyone can, can hear it and then uh, the program officers will answer it. Or if you have a question but you really would prefer to be anonymous, you can chat directly to either me or to Mariama uh, and we'll read your, your chat question but without uh, your name attached. So three options. Uh, we won't give like precedence to one over the other. So just use whatever is most comfortable to you. Um, and I will see, Ellen, do you still have a question since your hand is up a second ago? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. I actually have two quick questions. They should be pretty quick. Uh, the first question was about like the last slide. Are the one pagers for this exercise, should they be targeting a specific program? And that's why you're putting in us in groups with 
similar interests? I can just speak to the Google form and then Kelly, I'll pass it. Actually, Kelly, you go first and then I'll speak to the Google form perspective. <laughs> you know, I think that can be part of the conversation, right? If you're not familiar with the different programs, uh, again, you're just being kind of put together in a group just so that you can speak the same language, not necessarily so that you're aimed at a specific program. That's it. Um, and as you develop this, we can actually help you guys and say, you know what, this does have relevance here, relevance there, it can be part of the conversation. And that's exactly what happens behind the scenes for one pagers that we receive all the time. You know, people are like, hey, I think this is appropriate for Arctic natural sciences, what do you think? And we can start that conversation. That's absolutely part of the conversation. Yeah, and logis okay. logistically speaking from the Google form, we'll send arounds perspective is we'll have everyone identify up to three programs that you're interested in or your research might be related to, and you'll be sorted into ideally like groups with potentially some exceptions if there are just a couple of folks um, who are in different programs. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, second question is, uh, is the RU uh, solicitation a supplementary program or can it be standalone? Look at all of us go quiet. Let me, I have, that. <laughs> that's a really, really good question. Um, I don't think it's standalone, but I could be wrong. Dave or Lauren, do you have? Yeah, if it, yeah they're typically run as uh, little pods and they are uh, usually, uh, yes, yeah, supplemented to uh, other awards, but um, they don't typically they they don't come through the um, standard um, proposal stream as the rest. So, um, if you're thinking about adding an undergraduate onto your project, that's sort of a separate um, element. I just put the RU program page in the in the chat. Um, all right, we've got a question from Alexis on what the best, what is the best way to educate myself on what's important to NSF right now? Yeah, and I took myself on mute to, to answer this one. And I think Kelly mentioned the Dear Colleague letters. Um, th this is a great question because it, it's hard to know. Um, as a rotator, um, I also am not sure what is priority to NSF. Um, one of the beauties of NSF is it is ground up. So we that's why we have sort of blanket um, solicitations uh, that just allow anything. So send us your best ideas. Um, but in addition to that, we have dear colleague letters and that's our way of telling the community. Or one of the reasons or uses of dear colleague letters is to tell communities what is a priority to uh, NSF or a particular um, director at any given time. So Kelly mentioned the data um, and sample reuse dear colleague letter. That's signaling to the community that we are asking, we want proposals to use data and sample reuse. So that's one example of um, ways of keeping an eye out for what is a priority. Um, and of course, the other way is to talk to your program officer with, with a one pager. So that's part of what this iteration is, is to, um, to get a feeling of, of how your research ideas fit into um, a program's uh, priorities. I'm sure Kelly and Lauren have something to add, but. Dave, I think that's a really good answer. <clears throat> and I think another important point, which you, you hit on was that, you know, what is important to NSF is, is really what's important to the research community because your proposals are being evaluated by the research community through external reviews and through panels and those folks are providing guidance to NSF on, on how we make our decisions. So I think it's what's important to NSF, but it's also what's important in the research community and sharing with that with us and justifying that in your one pager is, is very helpful. Before I call on the next person, I'm just going to um, flag a couple of things that have happened in the chat. Um, so Maggie asked about uh, receiving feedback, although um, they'll be out in the field during July. Um, just wanted to make sure, Maggie, you saw that Kelly responded to that about sending a direct email. Um, and then someone asked about, uh, oh, Maggie also asked whether there's an example of a good one pager that we could work from. Um, and Kelly just noted that these are often sensitive documents, so they don't you know, share them publicly. 
Um, but working with a team can be really helpful for getting experience and exposure to the process. Liz, can I just add one thing really quickly? Please. For that reason, I think it'd be really good, even if you're going to miss the actual event on the 17th of July, I suggest you work with a team so that you do get that experience, that sort of collaborative experience of putting something together. Even if you don't get the feedback, that can still be extremely meaningful. Right. So if you're just going to be a field work for the, you know, the actual day, but you'll be around up to that point, I think that could be a, a really good opportunity. Great. Um, Elizabeth, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I was wondering, Dave, you were talking about the eager and the rapid uh, proposals. And I was wondering with the rapid, you mentioned it doesn't have to be specifically an event that's happened. It could be, you know, you have the opportunity to go into the field related to, you know, maybe Antarctic work, um, you know, is there, does the rapid have to happen within say like a year uh, of the proposal being submitted? Because a lot of times, you know, field work is planned way in advance, but if you know you can get a berth and maybe you need some equipment support or something like that, is that something that sort of works within the rapid or is that outside of the scope? I don't know if that's too specific a question, um, but specifically for field work related rapids. Can I jump in for part of that, Dave? And I would say if you have enough lead time, I think we'd strongly encourage a full proposal. Um, keep in mind, rapids are limited with respect to both dollar and time. So you have one year to accomplish the work in a rapid. So that could be a limiting factor and right there. But they're, 100, they're 000, really limited. Is that correct? I the 200 I two in my head. Yeah. yeah. Two, um, okay. You know, but but more importantly, if you have that lead time. I think we'd rather see a full proposal. Uh, it doesn't sound as, so I think our program more than others is a little bit more relaxed about that, that it doesn't have to be, you know, an earthquake, a volcanic type event that, that triggers a rapid uh, because of the, you know, the, the, the difficulties of getting to both the Arctic and the Antarctic, especially right now. So we've been a little bit, you know, if you find those relationships great and if they emerge quickly, we're sympathetic and we'll, we'll work with you. But in general, if you have a lot of lead time, that's not the mechanism. That makes sense. Thank you. And related to that, I saw um, Kay asked in the chat how rapid the response can be for a rapid proposal. And Kelly responded uh, on the very fast timelines, weeks, but often closer to one to two months. So just uh, in terms of what the timeline is there. Um, all right, Naomi, go ahead. Hi everyone, thanks so much. Um, I was wondering more generally, like how do you decide whether or not to submit a full proposal to NASA versus NSF? And if you have any tips or guidelines on separating out what works best for the different foundations. I've got a foot in both countries, so I could probably take that one. Kelly guys like this one. <laughs> um, uh, you know, again, my IPA, my home institute is actually NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, you know, NASA obviously spends a lot of money in building infrastructure to, for Earth exploration, generally from space, sometimes from uh, air, sometimes even on the ground. Um, I think if your proposal, if your interest is heavily remote sensing, it, it might be more appropriate for a NASA type um, uh, proposal. Um, that doesn't mean that NSF proposals can't have a remote sensing component to them. But what you wanna do is be ahead of the reviewers. Is a reviewer gonna read this and in a limited budget scenario, are they gonna be asking themselves, is this really appropriate to NSF? Every solicitation wants you to show that this is relevant to NSF's uh, goals and, and missions. So uh, I think as you're, this is another place where one pager can help you out incredibly. If you start the conversation with the program officers, they're going to be able to tell you, hey, this is really a NASA proposal or, um, you know, this is too remote sensing need or, you know, they'll, they'll help you navigate those waters. Also, keep in mind that those two proposal styles are a little bit different. So if, say, you have been rejected on the NASA side and somebody told you, hey, that's more appropriate for NSF, make sure you're really reworking the proposal to make it appropriate for our solicitations and vice versa. Uh, in the chat, we had a question from Amanda about whether eagers are also limited to one year, similar to the rapids. Uh, and Lauren noted that the request can be for up to 300K, including indirect costs and up to two years in duration. Um, so a little bit longer there. And then we have a question I see. Amanda, your hand is up. Go ahead. 
Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, this is really useful. Thanks for taking the time to all the, the POs and, and IARPIC and Paseco. Um, I, I was curious with the first, um, in regards to the Dear Colleagues letters, um, since they communicate maybe priorities for NSF uh, along a shorter time scale, or you're able to turn those around quicker to communicate to the community what might be important, how, um, for someone that's responding and trying to incorporate some of those contents into a proposal, I guess, how is that accounted for in panel? What's the review process like on the other side, uh, taking into account the, those dear colleague priorities? Thank you. I can start that with Dave's coming up. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, so the most dear colleague letters, that, that's a good question. And dear colleague letters are confusing to both internally at NSF and ex externally. So we're really trying to work on them because um, there's very different flavors. But yeah, so some flavors are actually calling for specific proposals. Um, we don't really have those in OPP at the moment. So what it would be is in your proposal, you would you would identify an element, say the um, data and sample reuse that Kelly mentioned, and you would highlight in your proposal how this element of your proposal is responsive to that dear colleague letter. And so there's there's not a different um, you know review process or or funding stream even. Um, but what it is is it's um, you know part the reviewers are picking up on how timely a proposal is because it's specifically calling out um, a dear colleague letter. And of course, you know, it's up to you to justify that it does really apply to that. Um, it is responsive to that dear colleague letter. But um, if any time you can call out an official document in a proposal, it's uh, usually a big strength. Um, so, you know, like some of the advice is tell people what you're going to tell them, then tell them and then remind them again. I think this, you, you know, being very clear in a, in a proposal um, with how your research ideas um, address current priorities is, is always strong. Mariela, go ahead. I have a question I'm asking for someone. Um, as someone who's doing this for the first time, um, like writing a one pager for the first time and maybe applying uh, to a grant for the first time. Um, they're wondering if you have any recommendations around how to, uh, quick tips, tricks, um, things you wish you would have known when you first wrote a one pager, um, that sort of thing to help them get kick started on the process. Lauren's off mute, go. <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad someone asked that question because I think I, the one in the chat too about are there any examples of a really good one pager and, and I think Kelly explained why we can't share those but I, I do know I've seen some things in one pagers that are not that helpful and so I was going to share one and maybe ask the other POs if you have any tips too but one thing I'll caution folks not to do is to come in with like an extensive literature review so I saw one recently where it was two pages and I'd say, you know, most of that two pages was a lit review. And it's really interesting. It's great to read. And then there were like a few sentences at the end. So here's the gap in knowledge and here's what we want to do. And it it just, it didn't have what we needed. Sorry, my cat's here. Um, so we sent it back and 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 explained that and said, you know, this is not, you know, I'm glad you have the lit review done. That's great. But for a one pager, I think we put up that slide with all those other pieces of information that's most helpful because that first, you know, attempt is really about evaluating fit, scope of the work. And so, so that's one thing. And I think also too, if it's your first time, just tell us and, and, you know, we can help you. And also if it's your first time, I would really encourage you to reach out to mentors at your home institution and you know, shoot it by one of them before you send it to NSF, and and that would be another great place to start to get some internal feedback before you do um, bring it to us at NSF. Dave or Kelly, <laughs> I will just say that I I remember when my that that's a, those are good points, Lauren. Um, yeah, what what not to do? Um, don't be scared. Uh, I remember my mentor 
I, you know, I showed her a, a one pager and then she's like, that's great. But now you have to call up the program officer. And I put it off for months. Um, and that was Paul Cutler, um, who's not at all scary. Um, but it, it was, I don't know why I was so scared. And so, you know, you see us here. I don't think we're scary. We're trying not to be, we're trying to be much more um, open. Um, and so, yeah, don't hesitate on, uh, yeah, we want to talk about your research ideas and see um, where your your where they can be submitted. Um, so, yeah, don't be don't be scared. Is my don't. I'll just add, you know, follow the. Uh, at, at some point, we'll share a document that's sort of you should keep as a cheat sheet and just follow that. Um, there's no real uh, what do you call it template for this. Um, there are just elements that that we need to know and. If, if you follow that, the, the um, cheat sheet that we provide, we'll get most of those elements. Uh, Lee Wang has a question in the chat that I started to write, but it was going to get long. He asks, you know, if you give your input as a panelist or an ad hoc reviewer, you don't necessarily know the outcome of, of you know, where that input went. I can say that ad hoc reviewers and panelists provide guidance and uh, input to the program officers, but ultimately the the decision to push something forward for funding is on the program officers. And even then, we, you know, we're not actually making things official. Our uh, division of grants is the one that actually makes the official awards. So all of this is just guidance going forward. I think the only input that you can give back um, is, is that you, know, you can look up and see in any given fiscal year what was funded through our programs. Uh, this is all public information. But you know, proposals and whatnot, we consider those very, very sensitive pieces of information. And you know, that 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 helps you folks, right? Um, we're getting anonymous questions. People are nervous to, you know, ask ask questions that they don't think are fully cooked, and that's that's totally fine. Uh, but we're trying to be sensitive to that too. Uh, so that all those things kind of go hand in hand. Best way to figure out if how your input went for a, a proposal is basically to look down the road at, at what was funded and what wasn't. I know that's not a very uh, appealing response, but where we're at. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, for uh, responding to this. It's a great question. <clears throat> and I see in the chat, Claire had asked about how long a Dear Colleague letter is usually relevant for. You know, If it was released one or two years ago, is it still relevant? Uh, Kelly, you had noted that it varies. Uh, but, you know, if, if NSF thinks something's critical now, they're not going to think it's not important in the near future. Uh, is there anything you want to add to that? Just that um, there's certainly, you know, we put a Dear Colleague letter out, and I haven't seen anything that, um, you know, gets pulled down or is ir irrelevant, you know, in the six-month or eight-month time frame, which is sort of the proposal submission uh, and theoretically the response timelines that, that we have. So. And you know we're we're talking about data and sample reuse. There's a dear colleague letter out. Uh, even if that gets updated or kind of archived, doesn't you know that that's always going to be important to NSF? So if you call it out in a proposal, I, I I think the question there is pointing at you know if you call it out in your proposal, it, it it just gets archived. It doesn't mean that it's not important to us anymore. Lauren's got her hand up. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna I was just gonna say that sometimes dear colleague letters do get archived. Um, so that might be some indication about the timeliness, but it just depends on the dear colleague letter, if it's related to, yeah, something like sample and data reuse, or if it's something that's pointing to like a more specific, like solicitation or availability of funding, sometimes they will get archived. And so I think NSF has been working really hard to clean up their websites and make it easier for folks to navigate. So at the top of most web pages now, like I'm just looking at one, there was one for community hubs for collaborations between Arctic researchers and Arctic residents. That one has been archived. So that one, you know, I think still has relevance to Arctic research, but that particular colleague letter has been archived. And so in that case, responding to that one, you know, you could still mention it, but it's it might not be considered as timely as as one that's not archived. So that's helpful. Thank you guys.
And we've got one minute left for questions, so I'm going to flag two things. One is that Ellen asked how we get on the OPP listserv, and I was trying to find that link and can't. So if one of the program officers could drop it, that would be great. I'm um, trying hard. I'm struggling too. <laughs> I think the way to do that is you can sign up on like the main NSF webpage and you put your email in. And I'm guessing when you do that, you can then go in and, and decide who you want the emails from because I was looking for it earlier too and couldn't find it. So. Thank you. And then uh, for our final question, I will highlight Allison's question in the chat of uh, whether it's helpful to see figures in one pagers or bullet points or, or prose preferred. Kelly, you said figures are great. Um, Lauren, Dave, Kelly, any other formatting preferences? No, it's pretty free form for sure. Yeah, don't need prose, um, you know, full sentences. They can do bullets, but if they're full sentences um, would help. So you, you have a, you know, a full idea, but um, no, it doesn't have to be polished, um, you know, uh, from a grammatical standpoint or anything. I mean, we want your ideas to be as um, developed as they can at the stage. Um, you know, we don't want these at the very start, but um, yeah, no, it's, we're not looking for um, published work here. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Mariama. Thank you all for some really great questions and answers. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to thank the program officers for being with us on the call and everybody else here. Um, some next steps information. Uh, you will be matched with a group with whom to write a one pager, as I described, based on um, the programs that you express interest in, make sure that you do that by uh, the end of the day today, because we're going to try to give you as much time as you can to work with one another and communications with one another will be up to you all. We'll share email information or send a connector email, one or the other, um, and make sure you uh, submit the Google form by no later than the end of the day on the 20th. The link to that should be in the chat or will be here soon. Um, and we hope you found the workshop useful. We really, really appreciate your feedback on the workshop so we can figure out how to make them even more useful into the future into the future. So you can um, we're going to give you a couple of minutes here while we're on the call to get started on the Google form and to uh, give us your feedback via the Qualtrics survey that should be in the chat. Um, with that, that's all I have, but I see Kelly has a hand raised. Um, go for it, Kelly. Sorry, uh, we had created a Word document sort of, uh, what do you call it, sort of checklist. And I was wondering if we had that and if we were going to share that prior to. Yeah, we certainly, so we'll send a follow-up email to everyone. That's a good gotcha. logistics question. And we can share, um, I think you called it a cheat sheet before. We can share the cheat sheet. We can share the slides from today with everybody. Um, and if there's any other relevant information that we mentioned, we will send that along as well. Um, and, and that will be sent out with your pairing within the groups. We'll try to send that all at once. Um, and we encourage you to stay involved with Paseco and IARPIC as a sort of closing thought. Um, please check out the Paseco community Slack channel and the IARPIC collaborations um, space, which is such a useful resource. Um, and then there are some upcoming grants to be aware of through Paseco that we recommend you check out as well. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. I'll stop, I'll stop sharing my screen and um, we look forward to connecting with you all in uh, workshop number two for the program. Thanks. And uh, I'll also just note, so Catherine asked how many programs can they select in the um, Google form? I think, yeah, aim for three, but if there are more that you're super excited about, it's just gonna help us sort sort you and make sure that you get to a program officer who can um, speak to the, to the work that you wanna do. Yeah, great. Answer. It's it'll be a check all that'll apply, but it, it, check the programs that are most useful to you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll be in touch soon.